Welcome to the It's Time podcast with your host, Professor Dale Feinauer from the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh College of Business graduate programs. Welcome to another It's Time podcast, an offering of the UW Oshkosh College of Business graduate programs. I'm your host, Dale Finar. Once again, we're here at A.J. Armstrong Studios to help throw a little more fuel on the fire of your desire to enhance your management skills. Today, as all of the first season, we're focused on leadership. I'm really happy today to have with us something a little different. Today, we have a car salesman with us today <laughs> to talk to us about leadership. Tim Bergstrom, welcome. Thank hey. you very much for being here. I'm glad to be here. I'm excited. So thanks, Dale. Tell us about you. What, <clears throat> what's made you the leader you are today? Oh, goodness. Uh, I'm not even sure I call myself a leader. Uh, I'm on a journey just like everybody else. Um, but I would probably start with the mentors, and, and um, I'm, I'm a little different than most. I find mentorship from everyone. Uh, I was blessed with my parents. I've got an amazing father who's brilliant, entrepreneur, driving, caring, and a mother who is a, a nurse and a born leader and uh, very influential in my life. And then two great siblings who um, make sure I stay humble. And then I look at my wife and my kids and we're very involved in Make-A-Wish. I even find mentorship from a, uh, a young lady named Lydia who's 11 years old with uh, Down syndrome and a whole bunch of challenges. Um, I watch her go through a lot of pain and she just keeps getting back up and is always finding a way to be happy. And uh, so I would, I would tell you a big part of my life is just feeling that from others and, and learning from others. Tell me a little bit more about her. How, how does she motivate you as a leader to keep getting back up? Yeah. Well, it's tough to feel sorry for yourself when you spend some time with these families from Make-A-Wish. Um, you see what they all have to go through. And, you know, being a father myself, having three kids, I, I can't imagine the pain of, of having a, a child that has a, a pretty good chance of going to heaven. And, uh, all the pain that they have to go through and you have to witness it and the helplessness. And, you know, I, when you're in the hospital and you, you see how much they have to rely on doctors and nurses and how amazing it is when, when, you know, they're good at what they do from a standpoint of uh, they've got the, the knowledge, the training, the smarts, but that people skills where they can make that young girl feel comfortable and, and special when she's not excited about getting the needle in her arm. You, you look at all of that and you think to yourself, I'm just a car salesman. It's, it. I can I can get back up. I made a mistake today. It's okay. So. Would you say that that relative focus on being able to do both the technical side and the people side translates into your leadership approach? So uh, it's interesting that uh, you bring that up. I I think about our business. I I always knew I wanted to work with my father. Young, growing up, um, you know, cell phones didn't exist. And he was what I would call a serial entrepreneur. I don't think he'd ever say that. Uh, he started in, in the bar business. And in the bar business, he uh, um, never had a drink and loved it. He sold cars during the day. And then he went into hotels. And that's where I can remember my first memories because he had a hotel in Oshkosh, a hotel in Appleton, and a hotel in Nina. And so after he got done selling cars, he would go do rounds. So my mom would need maybe a break from one of her kids for one re reason. <laughs> she, she always took the middle child, which was me, and, and gave me up to dad. So I would go do rounds with him, and I'd get all this opportunity to talk and listen to him because there's no cell phone in the car. Um, and then uh, end up at these um, establishments where not only was he an entrepreneur, but he was... Um, what I think is the, the number one attribute of leadership is getting more out of people, uh, even more than they think they can get. Where he'd walk in the hotels, they'd be excited to see him. He'd remind them that they're doing a great job, why they're doing the job that they do, kind of give them that extra little positive energy so for the next guest it went well. And I just loved watching those relationships. So here I am in my career knowing I wanted to be in that business uh, we're no longer in hotels. We're no longer in bars. Uh, we're only in the car business. And I like cars. I can understand the basic 
of how a brake system works or a com uh, combustion engine or even a battery now or electric car, but I don't love it. It's, it's not, I don't have gasoline in my veins, as they say, or now kilowatts running through your system. Um, but I have people uh, skills and uh, that's my strength. I, I look at more, I'm an executor as far as trying to help people get more out of them. And being that we're not uh, a manufacturer, we are a retail operation that is in a service industry. We've never built a car, yet we sell 30,000 cars a year, um, do a billion in sales a year, over a billion in sales a year. And uh, we don't manufacture anything. All we do is provide a service. And you can only really do that through people and systems. And my skill set that I like to use, the part I enjoy, is bringing the people to the systems, making the systems easier for the guest, making it easier for our team, and then helping the team understand why they're doing it so that caring piece is still there. When you, you got here this morning and you're visiting with me and the rest of the, the crew that's here today, you, you clearly very much focused on getting to know each person. Mm -hmm. Tell me about you. And, and you listened to them. Yeah. Why, why do you do that? How's that relate to leadership? Um, great question. It's, it's fun that you picked up on that. Uh, people genuinely interest me. And uh, when I get to talk to individual people, when I learn about them and they tell you about them, they tend to be stronger, a little more bold, um, and they'll have a better day because they know they count. And I, I, we just got through COVID, right? Um, I think COVID was a, a challenging time for everybody. And I had one of these mental notes where uh, somebody sent me a clip and it was a fantastic little clip that a leader had put out there. And I'm not one of those that posts a, a share video on, on social media or LinkedIn and say, everybody watch this. I'm more the, I send it via text to somebody or, or Messenger or Google Chat. And because I want somebody to know I, I chose to send it to them, not, hey, look at this or look at me and I want you to see it. And the number one response back I got was, um, I really needed that or thank you. It wasn't. That was a great video. It was, and so we're in this time where people are just exacerbated and they need that energy, that the gift to them saying that they count by asking. I mean, right now this is tough. I feel like I've talked way too much and my, I know that I'm here for a podcast because you want me to talk, but I, I'm, it's killing me not to throw questions back at you. Um, and you know, car selling 101, the more the guest talks, the more comfortable they are, the more um, they help solidify the decision to purchase something, and the better experience for, for them. And here you're making me, I, I kind of feel like 90% of the time I'm going to have to talk. This is going to be an uncomfortable hour for me. It's fascinating you say that, and I'm, I'm breaking for what I typically do. Um, for me, it's 180 the opposite way because I'm used to doing presentations and being on. Mm -hmm. So approaching this, I had to figure out how to be 10% as opposed to 90%. So you and I are both uncomfortable at the moment trying to figure it out. Absolutely. Yeah. The, the thing I would share with you is sometimes the best thing you can do for somebody is to let them help you. Even though you could do it yourself, letting them help you gives them a feeling of being useful. So if you help me by doing the 90%, that's the most thing, the best thing you could do to help me so feel useful. So keep talking is what you're saying? There you go. <laughs> I see, How's yeah. that for a rationale? Thank you. Thank you. Tell me about your mother. Um, she was a surgical ward uh, nurse. And uh, I remember her working 7 to 11. Um, I can remember quite vividly how much her parents cared about her and how much she cared about her parents and her twin sister. And um, it's, it, it's amazing. She hasn't worked. You know, she, she had to give a, a lot of that up for us kids. As she, you know, she had three kids and she worked through most of our childhood, but not all of it. But even I was out for dinner for fish fry with my daughter last Friday and a lady came up and said, I'm Laura so-and-so and your mother trained me, and she's the most wonderful. They all talk about how beautiful she was, but as they continue to talk, she is a very pretty lady, but as they, as she, as they continue to talk, they always say how beautiful a heart she is, how, how caring she is. So I often say, and right, wrong, or indifferent, my older brother's an oral surgeon. He got the wicked smarts from both my, my mom and my dad because they're, they're both very smart people. I have a sister who's a, a tennis coach and 
uh, right now running the plaza and Nina to, to give back to the community and um, is a fantastic mother and she's just this genuine caring person and give back. I always say I'm that, that middle person that's just the car guy that tries to get the most out of other people. So I got that both from, from my parents. So, yeah, very blessed. Yeah, sounds like it. Yeah. W- was it kind of fun that people come up and talk about your mom? Because I assume a lot of people talk about your dad. Absolutely. I mean, it, it's in a lot of ways, it, it's kind of tough because so many people know him because he's, he's worked so hard on all these different businesses growing up. And, um, you know, you, I see it even now. I, I went out for dinner Sunday night with my wife, and I, I walked in and um, to a local restaurant, and I talked to six different tables on the way in because I knew them all because we change all their oil, and that's part of our business. My dad has always been that way, and I, I see my, my kids even cringing a little bit when we go out to eat. They, they like it when we eat at home or on the patio or go somewhere far off. Where mom, when people stop you, it's a real genuine discussion, and I'm proud about that. Cool. Yeah. What was your first leadership role? Hmm. Um, I would probably um, start with all the way back in, in school and uh, tell you on, on a basketball team. I, I don't think leaders always have to have that title. A uh, title isn't leadership. I never was the best player on the team. Um, somehow, and it, it shaped me a ton in life somewhere. It must have been seventh or eighth grade. A, a basketball coach picked me up for an AAU team, um, and I probably was the the least talented, slowest player on the team, and I was one of the last off the benches. So on the on the basketball team, I uh, um, was really excited to play on this AAU team and met some amazing uh, teammates. And I went from a school team where we we lost more games than we won, and all of a sudden I, I joined a team where we won more games than we lost. And uh, I remember the first tournament we lost, the the locker room, they were all crying. And I'm sitting there like, wow, we took second place. It's amazing. <laughs> but they were such driven individuals. And um, I knew I wasn't as talented as, as the other kids and on the team. And so during practice, I practiced really hard in that. And the coach was a tremendous mentor and teacher. Uh, Coach Jake, he and he would would pull me aside and and you know it wasn't he, he wasn't he was one of those leaders where it wasn't he didn't always tell you you were good he he was always trying to tell you how to get better and but he would also reinforce you with he's like you're you're playing tough watching you try and get rebounds that energy that intensity nobody else has that um not, nobody else is probably an stretch but he's like that's your strength for this team that's the energy for this team you're making the rest of them better and you will get opportunities in it's not going to be much tim um and so i i cheered a lot from the bench and and when i did get in you know they would cheer for me if i actually scored a bucket um fellow teammates and and i think that was kind of my first leadership role cuz i helped that team i believe i i never was uh, you know, nobody on that team is going to tell you I was a standout, I promise you. Um, but um, I still have those friends. They're still uh, in this community. I bump into them, and, and they've gone on to really neat careers and run little businesses. Um, and so I would tell you that would probably be my first m- memory of leadership. Uh, but then working for my dad, he, he really believed that, um, you know, all of his kids and and any any kids of, of friends and and family members that he would hire, he wanted to really put you through learning. He, he, he didn't think coddling helped you. Um, so I can remember working in our uh, express lube, and I, I would change oil in the bottom, and eventually I, I went to running it with a, a gentleman who still works with us today. Um, and the two of us were young kids, but we were driven to take great care of guests and and. We learned from each other and we kind of, I remember making games of it for all the younger teenagers that worked in the express loop where it was, as long as our guests leave here happy and the oil's in the car and the filter's on tight, we did a good job, but we wanted them to leave happy. We wanted to leave them in a better space than when they came in. And we had that express loop really cranking. Now, I was young and immature. I mean, I, I do remember playing oil filter hockey with brooms in the basement when it was down times rather than cleaning. They were old oil f- filters. We weren't them <laughs> sure. putting them on cars. Um, <laughs> but um, did that. 
you know, was on a sales team for a number of years. I think there's different leadership positions. It, truly, all teams have leaders. Leadership has really nothing to do with title. Um, so I, I, I led as I sold, I think. I set examples. Um, I screwed up and other people led me and, and brought me back into center. Talk I've, about screwing up. What have you learned from screwing up? <laughs> they just keep getting back up. We all screw up. Um, one of, again, I talked earlier about mentors. One of one of Dad's um, key quotes to me that he says often is, "You're human. That's not you didn't. That wasn't a good one. Uh, <laughs> try not to do that one again. Learn from it, but never complain. Never explain. He he always wanted you to just move on. Learn from it. It's your personal growth, but go on to the next thing. Um, before you know it, you won't remember it." from the, the pain that it caused because you screwed up or whatever you did wrong. Um, but you'll have learned from the growth and just move forward. Just keep going. So that's, that's gone towards one of those pieces where I try hard not to uh, worry and sweat, sweat the small stuff. Um, if I'm going to remember it in five years, I probably should sweat it. I, if, if I don't, um, then I, I've got to work on moving on. I do, I do a lot of times sweat the small stuff. Um, uh, I'll give you one yesterday. I, I really dodged a bullet. We were touring dealerships, and um, there was a, a lady in our guest lounge with a really young child, and my brain said grandma daughter, and or grandma <laughs> granddaughter, and so I was going to, I was. you always address the kids first. The parents love that. Grandparents love that. You always address the dog first if there's a pet. You learn that in salesman school. So I went to this young lady, and then... Because you you don't never approach them without the adult there, but when the adult is there, her her name was Julie or Julia, and I said like, hi Julia, and I was about to say out enjoying your grandma today, and something in my brain said don't say that, <laughs> and so I said, who who do you get to hang out with today? And she said my mom, I love my mom. And <laughs> had I made that mistake, I would have sweated it for two weeks. I would have felt bad about it. So I've got to. And, and certainly I don't want to make that mistake, but I've, I still have to not sweat the small things. And that would have been a bad one. That, that would have been awful. I, I, I see the awkward. But it's an interesting combination. Learn from it, but don't explain, and then move move. Yep. Move, move forward. forward. Yep. So the don't explain is don't rationalize why you did it. Don't what, – what, talk to me about the don't explain. The, Thank you. Uh, I think to explain is if it's a teaching moment and you're trying to teach others, you can explain it. But trying to explain yourself and rationalize why you made that mistake or complaining on how, you know, oh my gosh, look how old the lady is or looks or that doesn't do you any good. Um, just move forward. That I screwed up. So don't justify. Maybe that's a better way. Just okay. take, take the pain, move on, go forward. So. And now, a few words about some of the programs and services offered by the UW Oshkosh College of Business. Students in the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh MBA Executive Program get a first-hand look at global business in action during a 10-day international study tour, visiting two countries and exploring diverse cultures around the world. Rated one of the most impactful elements of the executive program, cohorts have toured top-tier businesses in Accra, Ghana, Beijing, China, Nagasaki, Japan, Panama City, Panama, Seoul, South Korea, Stockholm, Sweden, and more. Be part of something bigger than yourself and experience education beyond classroom walls. Connect with an MBA advisor today by emailing mba at uwosh.edu to learn more about the MBA executive program and upcoming international study tours. That's mba at uwosh.edu. It's time to achieve more. In the descriptor of the individual that you worked with in the Express Lube, you said he still works with us. Oh, yeah. Yep. Not for us, yep. with us. Yeah. So um, fortunately, I've had that training my whole life. I, my uncle's very involved in our business. Um, he's retired now, but he's not. You know, th this is a business <laughs> that sucks you in. And so he, he spent, he is as genuine a person as you get. And people are drawn to be with him. And, um, you know, my dad's genuine too, and, but he's also very driven and you put all that together. Uh, I'll, I'll switch gears a little bit. 
every now and then dad will talk about Napoleon, where Napoleon was winning because he was on the front lines and, and people were with him. And he would the world would be very different today if he didn't back off and get up on the top hill and start commanding from afar. Somehow he got convinced of that, and then he started losing because the team was no longer fighting with him. They were they were working for him. So to get the most out of anyone, and, and when you think about it, I, my uncle and my father both talk about you know treating others like family always, um, treating our teammates at work like family. Um, and you want to be a part of your family. You don't want to, you know, work for your father. You want to work with your father. And, um, or you don't want to... That, that family nucleus, I was fortunate enough to be in a family of five. We were with each other. I have memories, you know, going out to dinner together or boating together or um, playing games together. That togetherness is a we, we or a with. It's not a forever. And so... People light up when you tell them that, so it, it encourages it. And when you truly believe it, it works. It's so much easier. I want to come back to the genuine, but you've talked about family, treating mm -hmm. employees like family. And you also said that your father didn't believe in coddling you. So how do you manage your, how do you balance managing your employees like family, but also not coddling them, hold them accountable? Mm -hmm. how, how do you do both of those? When, when we say treat them like family, I didn't say just be nice to them. Right, um, I I can remember getting spanked. I can remember causing problems. I can re remember getting timeouts. All of that, kind of getting the most out of anybody. You you have to hold them accountable. Make sure they learn from it. Uh, grow, teach, all of that. So it, I didn't say just be nice to everybody. Certainly fill them with positive energy. Um, ha make sure that they leave in a better spot than when they when they came to be with you. Um, but you didn't hear me say just always, it's always roses and, and fairy tales and rainbows and unicorns. No, it's, and yeah, it's hard work. It really is. Which kind of leads me to our, our five T's. It looks like you're asking Go. for some of our, our secret sauce in sure. our company. Um, you know, the, the first thing is, is we truly believe our mission, which is we at Berkson Automotive strive to be the recognized leader of guest service, the commitment to treat everyone like family. Uh, that's been there since day one. Uh, we revisit it every year. We're still there and, and still think it connects, and we love it. Sometimes we have to have some of our younger teammates understand what we mean by treat people like family because of diff generational differences on how you treat pe uh, family members. Um, I was trying to be a, give you a little jest there, but the, the <laughs> dynamics change. I understand. Um, As an old guy, I understand. But... We, we then have our 11 basics of just guest service, and then we have our five T's of, of truly how to, how to run a business with culture. And the five T's is the one that um, I really connect and, and try to use uh, my position within the company to, to continue to remind, grow, and, and encourage our team is with these five T's. So Go on. First one's trust. So, and, and these T's you can use with fellow teammates, you can use it with family members, you can use it with friends, you can use it with um, guests. So people want to uh, have friends they trust, um, they want to do business with people they trust, they want to work with people they trust, so trust is key. And trust is established in a lot of ways. You know, let's use Amazon, I use that example a lot when we're teaching. Um, if, if they tell you you are going to get your package in three days and you want to order it before you go on your trip in four days, you know Amazon's going to come through. They don't break your trust. And so trust is built in a lot of ways. The number one thing is doing what you say you're going to do. Second part of building trust is being very transparent. If somebody has an oil leak, uh, we had a guest yesterday, very unhappy, uh, wrote me a page and a half email on how oil was all over their garage floor and we hadn't put their oil filter on tight. And the reality is we didn't. You know, I, these are these are humans. Um, 18-year-old kid feels really bad about it, but he didn't do it right. Rather than say that wasn't our fault or whatever, being very transparent, we screwed up, we want to come clean your garage floor, we'll hire a service if we have to, we'll make it right, but there's nothing wrong with being transparent. Um, if we say your car's going to be ready at 3 o'clock, we want it to be ready by 3 o'clock. If it isn't, rather than say something came up that isn't true, just be transparent. We didn't get it done. There's that builds trust, whether it's the right or the wrong. 
And uh, same thing with your team. If they say, you know, why can't I have this time off or why can't I get off today to, to be at the doctor's office rather than it's, you know, corporate says or, or you know, these are, you know, eight to five is what you agreed to work. You got to do it. Be transparent. We have two service advisors. One's off today. If you're gone for that hour, there's nobody to take care of the guests. How do we run our business without it? Then you can also then, when you're transparent like that, building that trust, say, help me figure out how to do this with you. Or if I cover you for that hour as the manager and do your job, can you help me on this? It builds trust. It builds relationship. Uh, the next one is T, uh, time. So you asked me to be here at a specific time. I walked in one minute before. In my heart, I was late. Um, you know, we... We've all heard of Lombardi time, uh, which is show up 15 minutes early. The way we look at it uh, in our company, the way we preach it is uh, it doesn't matter. When you're, when you're late, you're late, whether it's 30 seconds or 15 minutes. Um, and that goes with our guests. That goes with, um, you know, if you tell a mother you're going to have their car ready for them at 3 o'clock so they can pick up their kids from school at 315, even though it's ready by 305 or 310 and they're late to pick up their kids, you screwed them up and you're not building trust and, and you're not living up to what you said you do. If we have a meeting and it's 15 people are going to be in that meeting room and you show up five minutes late, you were disrespectful to um, all, all 15 teammates in that room. Um, so we work really hard. I'm not going to say we're perfect. I mean, yesterday was not one of my better days. I was, I was late to two meetings in a row or something. They kind of compounded because we stack them up. But I bet you... Throughout the year on meetings and that, we're 95%. And when you have it, that expectation, then everybody's that way. And so time is an important piece, and that's how you build trust um, and show people you care. Um, if you if you want to show a guest you don't care about, him, make them wait. Um, my dad, I, every time he gets going about guest treatment, you'll hear him talking about the, the dreaded W word. Don't ever say wait here um, because... You're using, you're wasting somebody's time. Um, he would rather say, be transparent. I'm going to go talk to the parts department. I'll be back in five minutes. Um, I'll meet you right here. Is way Because you've never said to them, wait. Or you say, come with me. We'll go talk to the parts department together um, and, and follow me. Now you're transparent and you haven't said wait. And we know there's time involved. Or... I'm just finishing with this other guest. It's going to take me five more minutes. Um, here's coffee. Here's a water. I'll be right back. Again, how you frame it, you didn't use the word wait. So time's an important one. Then the next one is is one that I wish I could have a better tea for, it, but we use tailored. And not not in your suit fits you, but <laughs> but in that everybody gets treated correctly for themselves. Nobody. The easiest way for me to define that is nobody wants to be a number. I don't want you to be the 14th guest I've talked to today. You know, I, I want to have walked in and met Maddie and learned about Maddie, and I want Maddie to feel important. And, and you end, did. That was the goal. She did. So, well, I don't want you to speak for her. We'd have to ask her. But but that was the, in, that was the intention, and that would be the intention with AJ. That would be the intention with Dale. And the goal, you know, if you use somebody's name, it's the easiest way to make sure they're tailored. You know, in a, in a given day in our business, or in a given week, we have 10,000 guest interactions every five days. Wow. Um, so I probably should have done the math and just said 2,000 interactions a day. But hmm. And that doesn't include all the internet and, and the email response times and the texting back. That's just, live person that's in live the per business. Interactions. And with a guest, not person-to-person -person interaction uh, with teammates. And so you, you look at that, and it's probably some math guru could tell you there's a lot more, but the kind of the <laughs> way we track it and measure it, you just don't want anybody to feel like they weren't the only one you cared about at that time. Uh, we don't answer phones on our service drive. Um, so our, our service advisor, the one that's advising you to, to maintain and repair your car, so often the phone used to ring and they'd schedule their appointment and the guests all were used to that, but we had to transfer the to schedulers, just like a doctor's office, not because their time was more valuable, um, but it was very difficult. If, if you're the guest in front of me and the phone is ringing, I'm, I'm having to choose between two guests. 
And um, so we wanted that interaction only to be about you. And because um, that's the place it should be. It's your time. It's valuable. It's need. You can't be a number. I, I want to just. So that's insightful because I can remember standing in line uh, with somebody, the phone ringing, thinking, well, I should just call these people because the phone person's getting jumped in front of me. Yeah. Fascinating. And, and we look at it other ways. We we would say our average hold time. So when we made that conversion uh, that and we struggle with that conversion still today because people want to talk to the direct source, we, we compare it to a doctor's office. When you're in the doctor's office, is he answering his phone? Is he looking at his cell phone? We don't want you to do any of that. We want you to make it about Dale. And um, they're paying for that experience to be in front of you to get the best care for their car. And, and it's it's a big deal caring for your car because your family's in that car and, and you want it to work. You don't want to you know, break down at 1 o'clock at night. So they're not looking underneath the hood and underneath the car and trying to make it work. You are. You're you're the doctor of that car or you're using the the technicians as a lab to figure out what's all wrong with the car. We need to have that time go well. But when we first did this, it was two minutes, 42 seconds was our average hold time. And in that two minutes and 42 seconds, um, it's a lifetime when you're on the other end of the phone. I mean, it, it literally feels like Ma Bell, you know, when you, when you used right. to, you remember those days and it's, it's, I'm starting to prove my age. I've always, <laughs> I grew up, I'm in a, a very weird position in my life because I grew up in the car business, always being the young kid that, you know, I, I started there when I was 10 years old, 12 years old, running around with dad. Um, and it was always amazing how far you had gotten being so young in life. <laughs> but, and I'm, I'm never going to grow up. I saw a sign on the way in. It's, it's a trick growing up. I'm still young at heart. Often my dad tells me I need to mature a little bit more, but, um, and he's probably right in some regards. Um, but I'll always err on the side of being a kid. But um, I'm in this point now where I start telling stories and you have these these younger generation teammates look at you like, that's not connecting with me. I have no clue what you're talking about. And one of them is, is you know, the telephone cord with a busy signal. You know, I, I remember growing up, I absolutely hated the friends that had sisters because they were always on the phone. And when you were trying to get a hold of your friend, you got that, er, er, er. you tell that story now to a lot of these uh, team members were, were grooming and training and growing. Um, it's, they look at you like, what are you talking about? Right. But um, this, this cell phone has changed us to immediate gratification. And so you get a text in, you look at it, you can respond to it in seconds. Uh, here we are, you, you call into a dealership and you wait two minutes, 42 seconds for a service advisor. Well, now you put it in, in the setting that what we're having to deal with. What, what's often is when we're trying to train and teach, that's when we realize we got to correct a process. So Dale, you're my service advisor and you're saying, okay, what do you want me to do, Mr. Bergstrom? Or what do you want me to do, Tim? I've got you in front of me as a guest. I want you to feel special. I'm supposed to be tailored. But the phone is ringing next to me, and the receptionist is saying, this is a very unhappy guest, and he wants to talk to you. He's been on hold for X amount. He still wants to talk to me. What should I do? So when you think of the options they have is, one, like you were as a – now I'm going to flip back to when you were the guest and I'm the service advisor because um, the only way I can do this is make it complicated, apparently, cheapers. Um, but <laughs> if if I answer, if I take the phone in front, you think I'm not important. Or I heard you say today, I should have just called. I got in front of them. Uh, yes. So so taking the phone's not a question. So now I don't answer the phone. So now you think to yourself, well, no wonder why uh, I got stuck on hold for so long. He doesn't care enough to answer the phone. <laughs> I mean, the poor sales or service advisor can't win. Um, yes. And, and I'll tell you, we, we were leaning more towards men for a while because uh, women, whether we like it or not, are much stronger emotional quotient people. And they, On could, average. they could yep. tell we were un making these guests unhappy. And in doing that, um, you know, it, it was killing them because the one empathy. The, correct. Um, even with negotiating, we went away from negotiating on the, on the car sales side. So now it's an upfront price. Yes. Um, that's As a customer, good move. Thank you. Oh, man. You don't understand what it took to get there, um, but we got there, which was wonderful. It has opened up so many more doors. We have so many more women on our team now, and we're just getting started. I, you know, We certainly want 50-50 or greater than that, 
but women high EQ, uh, they they struggle with this negotiation because that not because they can't negotiate. They're probably better at it than you and I. But they knew how frustrating it was for guests. You know, the average um, time it took to buy a car from a dealership, not not our dealership, but but our dealership is pretty close to average on some of these things, was seven hours. And four hours of it was waiting. I mean, that's what a waste. Um, I, yes, I remember thinking so, that. So I have um, the money, you have the car. Can't we just do this deal? Correct. And there was a lot of reasons on why it got there. I mean, it, it was a it, it worked. There was nothing wrong with with the logic on how it worked because it, it isn't. It's a high consideration purchase that you spend a lot of money on. And what what it was working with emotional psychological thing. Not only are you kind of frustrating them, but you're helping wear them down to to buy the car. But at the same time, you're getting them comfortable with this big decision because the price is coming down and and right. and so it it actually statistically sells more cars and really worked well forever. Uh, we're in a time where it's not selling more cars, which is wonderful for our industry. And um, we're past 10% of the, the dealerships now do it the way we're doing it. And it's working quite well for us. But when you represent every franchise in the U.S. Um, sold and um, you're trying to keep all your manufacturers happy and you're trying to understand all of their their buying programs on how we buy a car and how we retail it, make that all mesh into one system that you can do it all one way without having to negotiate and all the different rebates and coupons they give in that. There, there was a, it, it's amazing how complex things can get in order to make it simple, if that, if that makes sense to you. It does. Simple for us is, is really key. And as uh, a leader, you were trying to figure out how to cut through that. Oh, and then take our team through the change and, and take our leaders through the change. And in a lot of cases, the skill sets that we had had, had to hire weren't necessarily the skill sets we needed as we went forward. You know, being a good negotiator, uh, you know, sales managers, they were really good at what was called closing the deal or having a guest be comfortable with making that final decision. Now we needed them to be coaches and mentors and and not be stepping into the room to close the deal, but instead encouraging you outside the room and helping you figure out how to call the guests back and, and help them answer their questions, it help get them comfortable with their purchase. As a leader, how do you manage that where the skill set that you wanted and the skill set that the organization needs moving forward are different? And I'm an employee struggling with that. And now a few words about some of the programs and services offered by the UW Oshkosh College of Business. The Cybersecurity Center of Excellence at the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh is focused on solving tomorrow's problems today. Corporations and other businesses in Northeast Wisconsin can utilize the center for threat analysis, incident response assistance, cybersecurity awareness and training programs, and professional development for technical and other staff. Learn more about the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh Cybersecurity Center of Excellence at uwo.sh slash cybersecurity. That's uwo.sh slash cybersecurity. You, you find really good help. You find really good good uh, leaders and trainers and people that have been through this. You ask a lot of questions. Uh, you're okay with failing along the way and making mistakes and restarting. You make sure that uh, your business is healthy enough uh, that you can get through the, the lows because there's definitely a J curve. Um, and then you be you use those five T's and you be very transparent. We didn't hit the fifth T. No, we, fit, we, we're only up to three. We've no, got, we had four. Well, we got time. We, we got trust, trust time, time, truly unique. No, no. Tailored. No, we're going to help you. Tailored. So trust, you build it through transparency. Oh, so, so transparency was Tran the second one. Was the second okay, T. Okay, so time. Then Trust, time, you value your time. time. Then it's tailored. tailored. You're giving them a unique experience for them. The final one is training. So you train, 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 train. And the only way to get better is to, to keep... And, and training doesn't mean throw somebody in a room. Training means, all right, when we were working with this guest that didn't go well, let's afterwards sidebar and talk about it. Um, let's, let's go through uh, what just happened here. What could we have be done better? Have you thought about doing it this way? That's We call them teaching moments. Look for the opportunity to have that teaching moment. 
always approach it as kind of a we. How do we get better? How do we help you get better? I just saw a quote yesterday that um, one of the uh, athletic directors of local school system just posted. It was, you know, um, uh, weak weak teammates or, or weak players are the ones that want to be told they're doing a good job and they're the best player out there. And true champions and winners are the ones saying, tell me how I can get better. And so if there's a way you can help somebody realize you're only doing it to, to help them keep growing and hone their skills and get going there. So your question of how do you get that kind of transformational shift is you, you start with this is where we are today and really help everybody understand this is where we are. Then you look for where do you want to go. Then you help everybody understand why and make sure they're all bought into that. Because if they, I'm a big Simon Sinek fan. I don't know if you read him at all, but start with why and yes. leaders eat last. And and but if you can really help somebody understand why you why we all think this is where we want to be, and then you kind of map out this is the thought process to get there, but then you don't hold true to that thought process. You keep pivoting along the way, and you just make sure you keep revisiting back. Are we getting closer yeah. to the goal or not? And yeah. um, we, when, when you're switching something that big in your business, for us, you, you can't do it halfway. You're, you're either pregnant or you're not. You're either fully negotiating or you're fully not negotiating. Because if you say you're, you're allowed to have some wiggle room in there or over time, it just builds no trust. Right. And we're going away from the five T's. So we're very transparent. This is going to be a burn the boat. You know, that's one of dad's favorite things. You know, he, we learned from the wise man. He, when, you, when you landed, you burn the boats. You have one option. You either win, but there's no retreat. Team, we're not going back. There's no, if we don't. We don't make you, it the new world. Yep. So we're going to make it. And let's figure out how to get there. So that's. One of the things I've heard a couple of spots here is introspection. When it comes to a problem, what went wrong, you try to be introspective about it. And at a personal level, in terms of your own leadership journey, I heard back on that basketball court, you're introspective about what you brought to the team. Mm -hmm. How important is being introspective to being a good leader? Um, you're, you're at a level here. I'm just a car salesman. So um, I, I would tell you, it's, it's, I look at it as, as the lens we're looking through. So... My son, when he's asking me questions about business and, and he's raw and he wants to learn, he's got the lens of all he knows at this point. And my dad, having been through the different public boards and all that, he's looking through this lens. And so when we when we sit down and coach and all that, we're looking through our lens. We're asking to see through our guest lens. We're asking to see through our team's lens. Through that thought process of what lens are they looking through, what lens are they coming through, is when we get that introspective piece. So the lens of me sitting on that sidelines, I'm cheering for the other players, rather than sulking and feeling bad I never get in, that coach is pulling me aside and saying, I see you want to get in, but I want you to earn that. I want you to play hard. And if you get that opportunity, be proud you get that opportunity. But otherwise, this is how you support the team. This is the lens... You and he would frame that lens on how I was watching the team rather than, oh, poor me, I never get in, or I'm better than this kid, I should have a shot. It, it, it's not. He's like, I want the team to win. You can bring positive stuff to the team or not. Do you want to be a part of that? And it, 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 he, he had a lot of strengths. We all have a lot of weaknesses. He had weaknesses too. But what, what that taught me was you play to your strengths, you look through that lens trying to find the positive in it. You see the weaknesses, but you don't don't make those weaknesses worse. You know, you don't you don't harbor on the bad. Um, I see a pattern that you tend to give other people credit for lots of stuff. Um, but back to the introspection, what I think I'm hearing you say is that a, a good leader, that basketball coach, helped you be introspective. That that's part sure. of leadership is not only being introspective about yourself. But helping others be introspective. Correct. And I, that, that helps you with that inner fire. Um, when, when I talk in our leadership classes or orientation, I really, I, I cannot remember the, the last day 
I went to work where I didn't look forward to going to work. Um, that's a blessing. That I, I, I look forward to working with our team. I look forward to handling the challenges. When you have guests very unhappy that they ordered, you know, last night I'm uh, out at an event and somebody's ordered a car 18 months ago and they're still waiting and they still don't know when they're going to get it. And I, I feel bad for them. You have that empathy. I necessarily can't control it, but I can help him understand what's causing that or why it's worth the, the wait. So anyways, going back, those negative challenges that are all out there, if, if, if I still frame it right in my mind that I'm enjoying coming to work and that's my job, you know, if it was all just easy, the manufacturers could, could drop these cars <laughs> off. They wouldn't need me. They, they, it's job security for me. So I look forward to coming to work. So if I can create an environment where all of our team members look forward to coming to work, we're going to get more out of them. Like, you, you talk about the flow. You've heard about the flow or yes. the shooter's touch when all of a sudden he's feeling it in, in the basketball game. If we can keep getting our team members to, to really, in stressful situation, but have that flow piece of it, um, I, I really believe in that. I, when I'm having fun, I provide a better product and leadership for our team. And I believe when they're having fun, they're providing a better experience for our guests at we, we, I refer to my dad a lot because I work with him a lot. He's my best friend, my mentor, my dad, all sorts of stuff, my boss. And we spend a lot of time talking on things. We can walk into a dealership and tell you just by the feel whether the place is winning or not. It, and it is it is crazy. Uh, we do uh, an engagement survey every year to listen to our team to say, all right, how engaged are you? in a very third party, stay away from us, so you're just telling us raw, you know, we're not worried about the political side of it, we just wanna tell you how we can get better. These Our teammates can tell us how to get better. We can tell you where the scores are gonna end up just by the feel before the score, before the team members even fill out the forms. It's amazing, and that, I think that comes from this why, this inner fire. And you and I talked about it a little earlier where um, this enjoyment at work, this this purpose at work, this get the most out of your teammates. Again, when we're we're teaching our orientations or or our training sessions or even our our future management sessions or future leader sessions or our current leader sessions, the number one question you always get asked is, you know, how do how do I move up in this company? How do I move up? How do I move up? And uh, the answer, I, the first time I shared it, I didn't even really have to give it much thought. It just came from the heart, and it's it's so true, and it's still there. And I think you ask any of our leaders, it's the same thing. You move up in our company when you as a team member make others better around you, when when people perform better because you're on their team, uh, when when they perform better uh, because you made made their day better, made guest days better. Um, I, when I think of just of our, our best leaders out there, they weren't necessarily the, the best um, salesperson. They weren't the best service advisor. You know, they weren't maybe the best quarterback, Aaron Rodgers or Brett Favre. They weren't the hero. Not necessarily. In some cases they are, so it, it doesn't mean they can't be. But they tend to be the ones that that help, it, it's cliche, but team build and help everybody feel important while they're at work. And I think that's a key thing, that the fact of helping others feel important, that their work matters at work. So It feels like one of the themes through this is a genuine caring about human beings. Is that, Without a doubt. And that's, that's a critical thing in terms of how you manage your business, how you lead. Is it also a characteristic that you look for in people that you are going to put into leadership roles in your organization. Yeah, you got to figure it out. It's just that simple. We have six, well, actually we're close to 1,800 teammates now. On, on average on our, our health benefits, there's roughly four family members counting on that paycheck. We don't want our team to think they, they have to come to work to get the paycheck. We want them to, to I go to work to earn, to provide for my life, and I'm, in, I'm enjoying coming to work, and I get, I get the benefit of getting paid. And in today's labor market and all that, you need that too. So it's a winning it's a winning piece um, when you kind of have that holistic approach of I'm not just a, a wheel uh, or a cog in the machine, and you know I'm not the the rat on the wheel or 
all those. It, I truly am a part of something. And it goes back to that basketball team where, you know, that, that coach can't play all 11 people the same amount of time and get cohesiveness out of it. Maybe you can if, if you're, you're a wizard coach, but you all have your defined role, but I still was made to feel important. I, I still went down on these long distance tournaments knowing that I was giving four days of my life up in some city to be a part of this and probably was only get, going to get to play a couple minutes, I still felt good about that. That's that's good leadership. That's good for the team. And we won a lot of stuff because of it. And I'm incredibly proud because I, I was part of those medals, even though I wasn't the guy that hit the winning shot or wasn't the guy that made the great defense. Well, I want to thank you for your time today. I also want to complain because you have boiled down genuine caring <laughs> about human beings as the essence of leadership and I, I take semesters teaching leadership, and now you've told these people that it really is just one simple thing. So uh, thank I'll, you for I'll your come time. To, I'll come to class and learn from you, and we'll call it even. <laughs> yeah, right. Because we'll you didn't it. talk enough here. You made me do all the talking. Well, I would love to, to come listen to you. And, and Well, that's very kind of you. Thank you. And I appreciate your being willing to step out of your normal mode and being willing to do most of the talking because that's, that's what we're looking for here today. And I'm, I'm sure the people listening appreciate your willingness to do that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank I appreciate you. your time. I enjoyed it very much so. Good. So, thanks. Thank you. It's Time is a production of the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh College of Business Graduate Programs in association with Venture Project Studios. Executive producer, Aaron J. Armstrong. Host, Professor Dale Feinauer. Creative director, Madison Potratz. Director of photography, Elizer Klune. Audio and video editor, Elizer Klune. Marketing strategy, Tara Larson. Social media, Anwar Mahana. A special thanks to L Creative, Top View Media, Michael Patton, and the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh College of Business graduate programs.